I think this is the evil genius of George W. Bush that to have couched this war on terror in those terms, that there's a sense fundamentally of closure that would come with bringing down physically, quantitatively, uh, what is a societal, what is a social, what is a political uh, problem, what is a historical issue. So I think it's adopting the wrong perspective on thinking along those terms. But it's been the dominant perspective uh, beyond policy making in the mainstream media, uh, among academia as well. I think that that's the wrong perspective. What we should look at is certainly an, uh, an ebb and flow phases, certainly ISIS is no longer in the position where it was two years ago. It has held the city of Mosul, the second biggest city in Iraq for three good years, which is a period that is simply too long for non-group to, to maintain that position. So I think right now what we can see though is, in, in to, to, to your point, looking forward what we can see is a couple of dynamics. One is a repositioning. I think we're like about 10 years ago when the Islamic State of Iraq the entity that was previously Al-Qaeda in Iraq was supposedly defeated after the surge and we thought everything was finished. And then we came back to see that another um, much more powerful entity came behind, which was ISIS. I think we're in this interlude where there's repositioning, there's regrouping, there's an issue about leadership. It's not exactly clear what's happening. Uh, Al-Baghdadi is in all likelihood dead. It's unclear and even if he isn't, the leadership is in crisis. So there's, there's an element there that has to be clarified and they're probably in between um, sort of phases when it comes to that. But the most important thing as far as I'm concerned is that the Islamic State as we've known it circa 2013 to 2017 is indeed for all practical purposes gone. I think what we are looking at is a mutated entity that is functioning at multiple levels. There is the Levantine dimension in Syria and Iraq, which is what I was describing, in between cycles. The, the issue there is not finished, so it might bounce back, or not necessarily immediately, so we'll have to be modest in our prediction there. But you also have the Islamic State, quote unquote, as an entity that has become much more transnational, much more global. The summer of 2016, we had almost on a weekly basis attacks around the world, from Asia to Europe to the Americas to parts of Africa, and that entity, which has become much more present in the Western world, which has been much more present in an individualized world, the Kuwashi brothers of this world, that entity is something that is also the legacy of what not only the Islamic State, but what Al-Qaeda initially used to be. And I think that societal dimension is what we have to keep an eye on. So I'm not surprised to see that entities such as particular groups in Asia or also in Africa, we might see that happening in the Sahel in West Africa, would come to actually reboot the entity from the periphery. One place we should also keep an eye on is Libya, uh, where I think it was already present and it might make a comeback. And finally, I think I also keep an eye on, uh, on the Sinai, where Ansar Beit al-Maqdis, which is officially a, a wilaya, a franchise of the Islamic State, has been quite active. So I think there's a lot there to come back to in terms of um, the, 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 political, the drivers of political violence that are having such huge humanitarian implications, but one of the biggest um, examples of that, of course, is Syria. And so I wanted to come to uh, Mark Lowcock, the newly appointed UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, coming to the UN after a long career as head of the uh, UK Department for International Development. Um, Mark, you were recently in Syria. Uh, how do you see things heading in a conflict that has actually surprisingly also dropped off the headlines as of late. Well, it was, I'd never been to Syria before and um, for reasons you're all very familiar with, the, it, it, it was the first visit by the emergency relief coordinator since 2015. So the main thing I was trying to do was get into a dialogue and hear from as many parties as possible and um, try to understand the operating environment for the humanitarian system in Syria. I mean, I think it is important to say that um, humanitarians are reaching 7.5 million Syrians all over the country every month. And um, I know we worry a lot about um, compassion fatigue and so on, but the UN was able to raise for the humanitarian response plan $1.7 billion. Mm -hmm. Um, last year. From my point of view, it was a problem that that money came exclusively uh, from Western donors. But it was, one thing we do need to hang on to as we're dealing with all these difficult problems actually is that 
without an effective humanitarian system, and we do have an effective humanitarian system for all the problems and challenges, and no doubt we'll talk about them, things would be a lot worse even than they are now. There are certainly parts of the country where things are calmer than they were than they were um, two or three years ago. That's um, you know that's evident, I think, to everybody. Equally, um, the situation has got a lot more complex, and the violence. There's obviously been a um, very um, unsettling spike in the violence over the last three months or so. Um, you know, we've we've um, all of us in the UN have expressed outrage about what's been happening in Eastern Ghouta. Um, we're, we're also extremely concerned about the situation in the Northeast, um, uh, including in Raqqa, where, from all the reports we're getting, the um, impact of the military activity to deal with, um, you know, Daesh or ISIL or ISIS or whatever, is, I mean, there's an there's a extraordinary amount of unexploded ordnance, um, one of the biggest problems still is very large numbers of casualties of people going back into the city. Um, and then the situation we've been seeing um, in Idlib and then in Afrin and the continuing sieges of um, Fur and Kafraya, um, continuing problems with accessing that, those 50,000 people in um, along the berm with um, Jordan um, in Rukban, continuing problems in Dara. You know, one of the big things we're trying to do in the UN, and Stefan de Mastur is um, hosting his meeting in um, in Vienna um, over the next couple of days, and then um, everyone will have to decide what to do about attending the um, Sochi meeting. One of the things we're trying to do is get the political process moved forward on the basis of 2254. But you have to say it's not the obvious moment to be expecting to make lots of progress on that when we see all of this military activity on the ground. I, what I was trying to do in my um, dialogue with everybody I met in Syria was um, try to remind people that um, there is a mandate for humanitarian action, and it comes from 46.182, um, and uh, the proposition there, which all the member states of the UN have signed up to, is that um, whatever, regardless of anything else, when there is a crisis, there should be um, access for people affected by the crisis to humanitarian assistance on a basis which is needs-driven and is independent and impartial um, and neutral. Um, and um, it, the strengths of what we have in Syria at the moment is that we do have, a, a I think, a very good um, needs-based assessment of what the needs are across the whole of the country. I think the um, needs assessment work that's been done by the National Population Movement um, Project, which the International Organization of Migration have run for a number of years now, um, which involve um, up to 140,000 interviews with people face-to-face -to, -face to, to build up a picture of what the needs are. The needs assessment is good, um, but the fact is that access, as a practical matter, um, is much better in some parts of the country than other parts of the country. So there's good access to those parts of the country which are... Um, under the control of the government, and there's good access to people who are reachable through the cross-border operations. But the situation for the hard to reach and besieged areas is very, very bad. And there hasn't, for example, we haven't been able to get a um, single convoy into Eastern Ghouta since November. Um, people obviously uh, were encouraged by um, the fact that there were some critically ill people let out of Eastern Ghouta at the end of December, early January, but that was part of a of a package that the UN wasn't involved with and wasn't wasn't constructed on a on the basis of humanitarian principles. It was a sort of deal involving some other people as well. So anyway, what I was trying to do was try to find um, things where I thought it would be possible soon to make some progress and. They include finalization of the humanitarian response plan for 2018. They include um, trying to get back to something a bit closer to an acceptable position on the convoys to the hard to reach and besieged areas. They include a, a much larger program of um, medical evacuation for hundreds of critically ill people from um, Eastern Ghouta. They include accessing um, the berm from Damascus. Uh, and they include, importantly, 
trying to improve the operating environment for both national NGOs and international NGOs. Now, um, time will tell on whether my hope that these were things that, having listened very carefully to everybody I met, weren't beyond the realms of possibility at the moment, whether that turns out to be true or not. But um, the situation is, um, you know, it, it continues to be an extremely bad situation where it's proving exceptionally difficult to get agreement on anything like approaching a, a um, means of operating which is consistent with the principles that all the member states have signed up to in the as part of their membership of the UN. Maybe just to pick up on a few of those points, um, because I think Syria is an extreme example of that blockage, but we're seeing it in all kinds of crises around the world today. So maybe to, to come to you, Ken, uh, Ken Roth, the executive director of Human Rights Watch, which is, of course, um, advocating on behalf of a lot of the people that are affected by uh, crises that are both human rights and humanitarian crises, and you can no longer <laughs> really always tell the difference. Um, you talked about this not being really an, uh, the best environment at the moment, uh, and I think there's a whole host of reasons why we could say that's the case, particularly today with a move towards uh, much more authoritarian governments, uh, uh, you know, a, a United States of America that is retreating from the world stage. Ken, how do you see the outlook for being able to come to some resolution in many of the crises that we're seeing today? And, and again, where, where else might you see some of the, the blockages in the year ahead? Look, I, I, I don't want to pick on Mark, but I, I listened very closely to what you just said. There were no actors mm. in your entire recitation. There were situations, you know, there were sieges, there were people who needed things, there was, you know, need-based assessments. Nobody did anything. Mm. You know, th this could have been a description of a tsunami, an earthquake, a forest fire. There are no actors. And I think that epitomizes the problem that I think we came here to discuss. And it, it is not just Mark. I mean, this is, this is a, a common approach among humanitarians to see, oh, there are needs. Um, doesn't really matter who did what. We're just going to try to get you know, food and shelter and medicine to people, and that's for the good. Uh, except that there are actors in these situations. So you know, it isn't just that there is a siege in eastern Ghouta. The Syrian army is pursuing a war crime strategy of starving 390,000 civilians in order to force the surrender of this territory. You know, it's not just there is military activity in Idlib, but it is that you know, Russian and Syrian bombers are either deliberately attacking civilian and civilian institutions or firing utterly indiscriminately so that you have, you know, what, two million displaced who are being pressed from the south from Syrian forces and from the north now by Turkish forces, and they are you know, in incredibly dire situations. And so, you know, this is not just a matter of semantics. This is a matter of, you know, how do you um, put pressure on the warring parties that are causing this humanitarian crisis because they are violating the most basic principles of the Geneva Conventions. So I don't cite a, you know, a, a non-binding General Assembly resolution. Um, I, I cite, you know, this legal treaty that everybody, including Syria, has signed on to, and which it is absolutely clear that it is criminal to be violating in the way that is done every single day. But how do you have that influence over them? Well, I mean, in the case in, 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 in the case an environment of where everyone is disregarding international humanitarian law. Yeah, no, I mean, in the case of Syria, because I think that at this point, you know, Assad is kind of beyond shaming. The key has been Putin. You know, because Putin does care about his reputation in a way that Assad is sort of past caring. Um, you know, Putin wants the Ukraine sanctions lifted. He wants a degree of normality in his relations with Europe. And the more he is seen as you know, providing the military possibilities for Assad to continue to pursue this war crime strategy of targeting and besieging civilians, the harder it is for him to get the things that he wants. And we've seen, you know, not always, but there have been times when it has been possible to get significant concessions from Russia. So why do we have a UN Security Council resolution authorizing cross-border aid? It's because here in Davos, whatever it was, four years ago, we um, adopted the Sochi strategy. And, and convinced all the relevant parties to introduce the resolution in the Security Council during the Sochi Olympics, when Putin would not want to veto and, and you know, ruin his party. And it worked. You know, and how, and, how optimistic are you that in the current landscape, in the year ahead, we can reach those kinds of breakthroughs? Well, I mean, I think that it's, I mean, I, is it going to work? Who knows? But you have to start by naming. 
the responsible actors. I think this is not just a matter, by the way, of humanitarian aid, it's also a matter of you know, the so-called peace process. Because you know, we've been talking peace now for, what, six years? And you know, of course everybody wants peace. But you know, if you say that that's the solution to Syria, then you don't really focus on the targeting of civilians. So, you know, I mean, John Kerry, who's running around here, was the author of this strategy to begin with. You know, I know they're killing civilians, but let's just have peace. We're going to focus on peace, and we're going to, you know, solve the Syrian problem. And, of course, you know, the peace talks go nowhere, but in the meantime, they're a bit of a diversion from what's really killing people, which is the targeting of the civilians. So I, I think, you know, you can, the international community is sophisticated enough that it can walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, by all means, you know, press for humanitarian aid, try to have, you know, peace talks, yes, but don't do that in lieu of pressure on the people who are doing the you know, deliberate slaughter. That is why we have five million Syrian refugees, why we have you know, seven million or whatever the number is in need and displaced within the country. And I think until we you know, recognize that there are human rights atrocities, you know, mass atrocities at the base of this humanitarian catastrophe, you know, as long as we keep treating it as a tsunami, we're not gonna really get to the heart of it. And I should say that it's not just, you know, the use of the passive voice. I mean, there are times when humanitarian involvement is actively contributing to the problem. And just I'll give one example. Um, you know, WHO has been supplying all the blood in Syria for years now, um, not you know directly to some humanitarian agency, but to the Syrian Defense Ministry, um, trusting them to distribute it all. You know, so we know that that's going to be problematic to begin with. But more to the point essentially subsidizing the defense ministry, because otherwise they would have to get their own blood. I mean, there's and a so, whole host of problems in yeah. Syria around the relationship yeah. between the UN and the government, yeah. uh, which we can come to if Mark's willing to engage on that. But maybe to take a step back, if we yeah. look at the roots, as you mentioned, of the Syrian crisis, they lie in a human rights crisis yeah. that was unaddressed and that escalated from there. And so I wanted to come to you, Sarah, um, before we get any further, and, and maybe just put this in, in a broader perspective, Sarah Pantoliano, Managing Director, as I mentioned off the top, of, of the Overseas Development Institute. Um, the new Secretary General of the UN has now prioritized conflict prevention um, in his agenda. And if we agree that human rights abuses left unaddressed do become the Syrias and Myanmar's of the world, what are the human rights crises today that we should be paying attention to if we don't want to see them turn into full-blown crises over the next year? Yeah, I think there is two or three that you know, should really keep us awake at night. Um, and I would say that human rights are the critical concern, but it's usually a, a combination of two or three factors that come together. You know, human rights abuse is one, but you know, economic deterioration and collapse tends to be another one, and societal fracture. And, you know, when the three come together, that's where we normally have, you know, humanitarian crisis. There are two that stand out to, in, in my mind, and, you know, that's Venezuela and Mozambique. I mean, Venezuela should really worry us on a, <laughs> on a daily basis. If you just look at the numbers um, of people that have moved into Ecuador, you know, in the space of a year, we had 236,000 people moving into Ecuador in the last few months, 15,000 people, you know, seeking asylum. Um, we see Human Rights Watch reporting all kind of, you know, um, human rights violation in country, you know, by security forces and other people that leave, quoting, you know, political persecution, but not just that. Actually, it is also, you know, uh, the challenge to access food and medicines that drives people to leave. And we've all seen on TV long lines of people, you know, queuing for food and the inability to access medicines is really a driving factor in, in you know, pushing so many people out of Ecuador. So it, to me, for me, the situation is really on the brink, but does not attract the level of attention and engagement that it should attract before it becomes too late. Um, equally, Mozambique, I think we've seen, you know, the last um, year, you know, a, a resurgence of tension between you know, Renamo and the government, and you know, human rights abuses on both sides, from you know, both the government and Renamo towards civilians. Again, we see people, you know, of concern, numbers of people of concerns going up, and, and, and we see also, what, you know, was defined last year as a perfect storm on the economic side. So you, you, you've seen you know, really some unfavorable fluctuations in the exchange rate for you know, Mozambique, the inability to service debt 
runaway inflation level of you know 25 percent all coming together you know gas prices plummeting the in so it means that the country is not able to you know really repay the debt the level that it should and compounded actually also by you know climatic pressures because we have seen you know rather erratic rains we've seen you know floods on levels that are quite serious again these are all signs that come together to um to signal an engagement, it's, it's really critical at an early stage to you know, prevent a crisis from escalating um, and then becoming you know, a really difficult, intractable humanitarian crisis. Perhaps to add a third, um, you know, El Salvador is another country of concern right now where we see level of you know, homicides that are you know, just tantamount to a conflict um, and is one of the deadliest countries in the world. And again, we see large numbers of people leaving. Just last year, 90,000 people leaving you know, El Salvador. But at the same time, people being repatriated clearly by, you know, from the US in increasing numbers, which again is going to compound the situation on the ground that was already really difficult. We did quite a lot of work over the summer for the, the, um, the SG, for the Secretary General, on the prevention agenda, which is actually not just prevention of conflict, it's <coughs> prevention of crisis. So, so at a broader level, which you know, means that also looks at food security crisis, looks at you know economic crisis, looks at the youth bulge as you know, a, a particular issue of concern that needs managing if you want to um, prevent crisis, um, and and it all so in these these type of situations are all um, you know up there for the leadership of the UN and others to to engage early, and it was interesting in the work that we did to see how. Um, how hesitant actually mm. organizations are in many ways to, to find the political space to step in. And sometimes actually it's almost a self-imposed um, censorship, you know, in terms of becoming more um, uh, political. To, to really go for, you know, an early action, early demarches in these countries where we see the situation deteriorate to a level that should really alarm us and, you know, get us to, to, to intervene more directly. So Mark, what's your vision of that? If you know, we know that the warning signs are there. We don't always, as an international system, have the right tools to actually act early mm. um, or that there are a whole series of obstacles. What's your view on how to um, address the kind of, at the early stages of crises? Well, I mean, firstly, I do agree that, you know, the single biggest problem in most of the crises we're dealing with arises from um, the behavior of belligerents in combat. And um, I think we need to be honest that there was never a golden era, actually, of wonderful compliance with the, with the, the laws of war. But I think it's obvious to everybody that um, after a period of 50 years, basically, after the end of the Second World War, when on average there was a decline of violence, um, certainly battle deaths fell on most of the data, we're, we, we're in a different era and there is a spike. And the the, you know, the central challenge is what is going to happen differently to get back on a path that I think the world uh, overall on average, of course, every, every era you look at there were problems, but um, overall on average, there was progress on lots of things. What would it take to get back onto that um, path? The thing about the UN, obviously, is that um, the UN is um, a stage on which the member states, the members, play out their behaviors. To some degree, the UN is also an actor. There are some things we can do. And, um, you know, the, the, um, the countries of the world have to decide whether, how effective they want the UN to be. The, um, the reason when Antonio Guterres called me in April last year that I was interested in doing this job is because I think he is a person who has got a clearer vision for what a more effective UN would be for the problems that require collective action in the 21st century than anybody else I've seen in that job, and also a strategy for achieving that vision. So the, you know, the three areas of reform we're working on feel to me like the right ones, but the extent to which we are able to progress them is not mostly in our hands in the UN. It's, it's mostly in the hands of the member states. So on the, on the issue of um, prevention, for example, um, we, I think Antonio has set out a very clear and coherent set of things that if the member states wanted in, to invest in, like preventive diplomacy, for example, um, would probably make a difference, like more effective peacekeeping operations would make a difference. But the trick, and here I do think the, 
role of civil society actually is very important. The trick is, what is it that's going to happen to cause the member states as a group to buy enough of that, um, that package? I think there is a push, though, uh, for humanitarians to stop um, painting themselves as these absolutely neutral and impartial actors who are gonna sit there and watch the same thing happen over and over and over and simply be the band-aid and for a more activist approach to humanitarianism, which is very uncomfortable for many of you. So I wonder from, from the, the, the other panelists, you know, when we look at what's coming up on the horizon, what do we need in order to be able to at least make a dent in what appears to be a continual spiraling out of control? Well, I would think that one of the, I agree that there's a need to, to look this in the eye and actually call a spade a spade. I think that one of the things that has been missing in this whole recent phase has been an excessive bureaucratization, a technocratic approach to these things that does take away essentially the humanity at the heart of the humanitarian and the human rights. Um, Bashar al-Assad is indeed involved in crimes of war. There's a responsibility and there's too many people involved in a whitewashing of what's happening. And I think there's a key moment there in 2014, 2015, where the so-called international community goes along that in the name of, or rather out of fear, of a larger different issue, which is specifically terrorism that we discussed earlier. But two wrongs don't make a right. And muddying up the waters in this way uh, while pretending that this particular conflict has specific reasons and that are pinpointable in a, in a moment that starts off, which is going back to the Arab Spring when this becomes a civil war, um, I think does a lot of harm to precisely the kind of work that the humanitarians are doing. And there's a responsibility there that has to the United Nations and the major powers of this world have to step up and address this in a way that brings back diplomacy, that brings back the values, that brings back the ethos of humanitarian work. But there's another dimension that I think is also missing, which I would add to what Sarah was mentioning in terms of the big dynamics at play, um, and Ken as well, which I think is, is, is the return of what uh, currently of a very negative tendencies around the world of, uh, and you kind of mentioned this, Iba, which is the sort of a reinforcing of authoritarianism globally. And we see, we see this across a vast spectrum uh, from the White House with uh, Donald Trump all the way to um, CC's Egypt by way of a number of countries around the world in Europe and in Asia and in Africa, you have a sort of moment in which authoritarianism is speaking, um, normalizing racism, normalizing sexism, normalizing discrimination, um, diminishing the importance of human rights. And, and that actually feeds into the social drivers that are at the heart of the conflicts. So we can't have it both ways. We can't call for the end of conflicts uh, in ways that are actually not specifically identifying what it is that creates that moment of rupture in which a society goes into producing violence, falling into um, violence, and replaying the game. Most of the conflicts of the 20th century have been conflicts where violence has recurred because the issues were not solved and were not addressed. So we live in a time where you know, a democracy calls for preventing people from entering its soil on the basis of their religion. And this creates a breaking news for about a week or two, and then it's normalized, and we move on. And the, the more you kind of normalize that and tolerate it, right, the more actually we add specific problems that are on top of what we were familiar with in terms of the 90s and early 2000s types of conflicts that had their complexity and needed processes and, and a certain professionalization for sure. But don't take away the ethos of addressing this precisely as what they are, as problems where humanity is dealt with in a, in a violation. Uh, of, of, and I think that is, is something that I find way too problematic and not addressed enough in terms of that. And so it's, it's too easy to say that we need to sort of simply find ways to have a process and launch it. And I mentioned diplomacy, for instance, which I find quite surprisingly missing from good old diplomacy that saved us from nuclear war in the early 60s, for instance. We kind of fall into awaiting rapidly that there, there's going to be a chapter seven kind of logic. And right, and all necessary means will be adopted measures so that you, you drift and go into that. 
Well, there's, there's actually a sequence, you know, and Geneva II and maybe some of these processes back to Syria could have dealt with this in a different way had we been more imaginative and I think and more creative as opposed to power politics that we fell into since then. So would you say we haven't actually even seen the real beginning of the effects of this if, if we're only now starting to see the rise of some of these authoritarian leaders, right. that the implications are yet to come, actually. Well, well you've heard the phrase, you know, that the, the 2010s are the new 30s. Um, and of course, you know, the 1930s and, and, and totalitarians are on a different scale. But um, as a historian, we see this happening in slow motion. You know, it's normalized and, you know, people uh, tolerate this and then they rationalize it and you see this materializing. I mean, take a look at the country like the United States, for instance. We discuss these humanitarian questions too often, North and South. Look at the return of racial tension, things that we thought were solved in the 60s and 70s. This is the type of dynamics that are not supposed to be back. These are the type of issues that you should be addressing so that they don't materialize. Look at a country like Myanmar, where essentially the ethnic and religious cleansing of a people is dealt with in, 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 in very late in the game. And the first word we hear from the president of that country is what terrorism, you know. And, and so I think it's very shocking and, and the absence of outrage when there's, there's plenty of it, of course, in many sectors. But politically, the dominant voices today, and we really have to have kind of a, a wake up call when it comes to this, is a, a, a definitive and I think visible um, coming back, a return sort of with a vengeance of authoritarians around the world. And you see the sympathy that, that Trump, um, for instance, uh, creates among many of these leaders around the world in terms of sort of the idea of a strong man, and, and you see that, but, and it's echoing back and forth. So I think, yes, I think it might get worse before it gets better when it comes to that political dynamic. Sorry, you were gonna jump in. I, I, was, I wanted to come back to what you were saying about you know, this challenge to if you want the principal framework around which we operate, because I think we see that more and more, you know, in, in the crisis in which um, we deploy, particularly with local organizations, with local partners who, you know, would challenge that, first of all, you know, as humanitarians, we always operate as independent and neutral actors because, you know, the, we, we do often pronounce um, adherence to the principles, but we don't, but also, you know, a, a challenge to, the framework as a whole, because not, in, I think there are two fundamental principles of humanitarian action, which is human, humanity and impartiality. Independence and neutrality are means to an end. And there are other principles that for people are even more important. You know, justice and solidarity are the two that people mention all the time. And in, there are organizations, particularly local organizations, that work much more on the basis of you know, solidarity and justice and still bring you know, relief to people in crisis that is needed. It's a different approach. You know, there are organizations for which, you know, Neutrality is critical, you know, the ability to, um, to seek and obtain consent um, in, to, with, with belligerents that control territory is predicated to the ability to be, you know, fully neutral and independent. But not everyone operates like that. And I think we should be a lot more honest in, you know, in, in really, first of all, um, declaring how we operate as humanitarian organizations, but also seeing that there is a value for those who actually uh, do embrace a more, um, you know, an, an agenda that takes, you know, human rights and protection of, of human rights for people much more at the heart of the work that they do on the ground. I, I recognize that we've talked a lot about um, conflict and a particular subset of conflict. I think that's um, appropriate in a world in which a, a large, 80% of humanitarian needs are driven by conflict, but of those conflicts, many of them fall into this category. But I do want to take a step back and recognize, of course, that we are seeing much more tangible implications of climate change, for example, over the last year, that we had after years of not having a single famine, suddenly four famines or near famines in, in one year. So if, if we take a step back at that wider landscape, Mark, what are you seeing on the horizon in terms of, uh, I suppose, the biggest challenges, but also maybe some of the bright spots in terms of where things are heading? Um, well, I mean, firstly, by the way, I think the famines or the threatened famines, which were largely staved off, were conflict related. They weren't primarily about um, the drought. The drought in Somalia was, it was a very bad drought, but um, the response was good because um, the agencies had access to more places. The, the response was later than it should have been, but, um, you know, beginning of last year, having worked on the 92 famine and the 2011 famine, I was terrified there was a serious risk of a, a much worse outcome in 2017. And the response was quite good. I, I think the... Um, 
there's some positives and some worrying things to think about when it comes to the natural disasters. Um, I think the, um, clearly um, we need to get ready for growing and increasing ferocity of storms and uh, you know, weather-related events um, in parts of the world which are vulnerable to those. Those storms we saw through the Caribbean were not like anything um, had been seen. People talk about 2005, but I think those storms were much more severe than 2005. One positive thing to say is that in previous eras, the loss of life through those storms would have been much higher. And the reason the loss of life was relatively low is because the storms were well tracked and everybody on every island knew what was going to hit when. Um, the destruction of property was very large. Yeah. Second positive, positive thing to say is that um, some of the um, sort of financing response vehicles that have been developed over the last 10 years have clicked into action in a reasonably encouraging way so that the um, insurance policies paid out within days for Dominica and Antigua and Barbuda, for example. And talking to uh, insurers here um, today, one of my worries was, would they all have to reprice everything having had that experience? But what they're saying is that was built into their models. They think this is a viable um, approach. And um, so, you know, these risk-based financing tools, I think, are going to be more necessary in future, but so far are standing up quite well to the to the um, pressures. Most countries in the world deal pretty well with natural disasters. The number of countries which need help with them uh, on a large scale is much smaller than it used to be. I think I, I've, I was also quite encouraged in, um, for example, the handling of the Mexico earthquake with um, in September last year with um, a growing sophistication of the way the Mexican authorities approached what they wanted help for and what they didn't want help for. In 85, as you'll, you'll remember, um, the massive earthquake and what was perceived as a poor response by the then authorities to it was germane to the government losing office and it attracted, you know, tremendous popular um, um, unrest and... Um, every government in the world, when they've got a disaster of that sort, the first thing they think about is, is, is this an existential problem for us? And so there's a, um, th there's a nervousness about announcing to the world we can't cope with this and we need international help. On the, um, the evening of the 20th of September when that earthquake hit, I had a whole series of conversations with the Mexican foreign minister who wanted to know who would have high-class search and rescue capability and would deploy it fast in a way which didn't involve Mexico having to announce to the world it had this problem it wasn't able to cope with. And I think the search and rescue capability that was put to work there, certainly the Mexicans were very grateful for, and it was timely and effective. So some of those bits of the system, um, I think, are um, improving. But my overall anxiety is that most countries aren't investing enough in resilience and aren't, aren't sort of changing their sort of standards and norms and behaviors to cope with the fact that a lot of them are going to have more of these natural disasters um, into the future than they've had in the past. So that's your anxiety. Ken, what's yours? Yeah, well, let me come back to, you know, sort of the, the rising authoritarianism, because, I mean, on the one hand, it obviously is contributing to many of these problems where you have somebody like Trump who seems to have this insatiable desire to embrace strongmen. Mm. And, and so that, you know, greatly aggravates the problem, you know, with Erdogan's Turkey or CC's Egypt. You know, sort of Putin in Russia, Xi Jinping in China, um, Duterte in the Philippines. I mean, you could just go on. But you know, all of these people, he's bonded with in some mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, the you know, I think in many ways, though, the interesting news of the last year is how much resistance has come out mm -hmm. against these kind of strong men. And so, in many ways, you know, Macron's campaign in France illustrated you know a serious pushback. You've seen it, you know, among civil society journalists, you know, judges and the like in the United States. Um, if you know, if you take Venezuela as one of the you know the big disasters. Latin American governments, I mean, 11 governments, the so-called um, you know, Lima Group plus Canada, have done something that they've never done before, which is they've spoken out actively against the human rights violations of one of their neighbors. You know, that traditionally wasn't done because it was seen as buying into sort of a you know, US imperialist um, agenda. But things were so dire in Venezuela, you know, not because there was a tsunami, but because of you know, utter autocratic mismanagement leading to the hyperinflation and the, the, the shortages in food and medicine, 
and so you know there was an effort to look at the political base of this, and and that continues to this day. It's a bit of a stalemate. You know, Maduro's trying to push back and and um, you know call prompt, quick elections and so forth. But um, you know that that I think is encouraging. And there have been other examples like that. If you look at you know Duterte's twelve thousand summary executions in the Philippines, there was actually an effort led by you know of all people Iceland, but it was at the UN Human Rights Council. They put together a group statement. Duterte tried to dismiss it as a bunch of crybabies, mm -hmm. but immediately switched drug enforcement from the police, which mm -hmm. were murdering people, to another anti-narcotics agency, which wasn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the big, if you, know, you think about what's the big problem in the next year, I worry about Congo in a DRC. Mm -hmm. And and there too, there's been you know real engagement because you know everybody recognizes that the source of the problem is Kabila's not you know unwillingness to follow the constitution, mm -hmm. hold elections, and and step down. And so not only is he killing protesters in Kinshasa. But he's actually fomenting armed conflict in 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 the Kasai region and in, in, in the, um, the Kivus because you know if the if the country's at war you can't hold elections and he doesn't have to step down and so you've seen you know a series of not only Western states so you know not only you know predictably the U.S. U.K. Belgium not so much France but um, but also a number of African countries you know particularly Angola. Um, but you know, President Conde of Guinea's been here as the AU head, and he's been very much involved. Um, and you know, even even Kagame of all people has has been involved here. So it's um, you know, there is a, um, a recognition that if if you don't address the political and human rights sources of the problem, Congo could utterly explode. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, already basically well, it, it the is, largest displacement crisis yeah. in the world. There's a displacement it's, crisis, but you know, it is not nearly as bad as it's going to be if this continues. So, you know, Congo is always a bit of a mess, but it could be so much worse if we don't, you know, get Kabila to step down within a year. And even the, the waves of sexual violence that we've seen in the past are now returning. We just did a, an investigation uh, a few weeks ago that found a new campaign of rape by government soldiers in villages um, where they're fighting rebels. And, uh, yeah, I would completely agree that that's one. I mean, we haven't talked about the Burundis of the world and the Central African Republics of the right. world and the South Sudans of the world. Um, there's Yemen. a whole other category, <laughs> Yemen. Mm -hmm. um, the list is endless. I guess it, it, when you look at that, Gail Smith, who spoke at um, ODI's annual lecture uh, recently, said she there was never a time that she felt more concerned, mm -hmm. and yet... We are at a point in, in kind of the overall evolution of human development in, in which you can argue things have never been better. And that kind of contradiction is very uncomfortable. And I don't want, you know, when, when you look ahead, you say, okay, we've got, we do a forgotten conflict series um, and we've counted 40 ongoing conflicts at the moment. So we haven't even scratched the surface in this discussion. Um, it, it's quite hard to kind of make sense of that. I, I think, I mean, for me, the big sort of strategic challenge for the world as a whole over the next generation is for that group of 30 or 40 countries who, who seem to be stuck in a cycle of violence and economic failure and um, instability and conflict and human rights abuses and all those things and aren't in the group of what's, what's actually 100 countries which over the last 25, 35 years have moved forward significantly um, how is the world going to interact with that group of countries in a different way in the period ahead so that we're not looking, looking at exactly the same situation but on a bigger scale 25 years from now? I think that is the, that's the sort of central strategic problem that, you know, fora like this ought to be thinking about because one thing that's absolutely obvious to me is we haven't got the toolkit. Um, the things we're doing are not moving those countries in the direction fast enough that, as I say, the best part of 100 other countries were able to move forward. And I would also say, Hibet, we are a very ahistorical sector. We always say there is an unprecedented mm. crisis, an unprecedented moment. You know that I ban the word unprecedented with my team because there is you know, mm. no crisis that hasn't had a, a level of resonance before. And if you think, you know, just back to the 90s, we had Angola, Sudan, mm. Somalia, the Balkans, all at the same Rwanda. time. Rwanda, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we tend, unfortunately, also for fundraising purposes, to exaggerate the situation mm. which we're in. But I think, you know, we need to acknowledge that, yes, as a system, we've got better, we've got a long way to go, but definitely 
Um, there, is, there is some progress in managing some crises. We definitely got a lot better on the natural hazard side, which means that you know there, is, that there can be more focus on the more intractable, difficult, protracted crisis. And we got to get a lot better, but you know incrementally, I think there are steps in the right direction. I think this is, this is very true. I think there's a lot of amnesia about the complexity of the uh, conflicts. For sure, I mean, as, as we've noted, there's, a, there's far more sophistication in the nature of the violence and the projection and the transnational dynamics and, and sort of the cumulative weight of that is, is objectively there. But the nature of the problems themselves have been met before. And so I don't, I'm not sure whether it's actually the toolkit or whether it's more the political will and the lack of leadership. I think this is one of the commodities that is very, very um, scarce today. The, the actual ability, and good leadership, obviously. And, and, and again, I'm back to this question of not looking at the global south as this perennially problematic destination, which we hear too often among commentators and professionals that this is a, this, it's very paternalistic. It's very orientalist. It's very neocolonialist. I think these are terms that have meaning and have, are used by a lot of us when we look at these questions. And I think we need to break through that and look at also the violence that is sort of brewing and playing out in the urban Western metropolis. This is invisible to many. These are humanitarian questions, pockets of poverty. I mean, you travel in places in North Africa, you feel like you're in the third world in, in terms of the social services and the discrimination and the violence. And those are issues that are not dealt with by the United Nations, that are not dealt with in the manner that they should be on an equal basis. Of course, the humanitarian issues that call for the need for the work that you guys are doing have to have the priority because they are on a larger scale. But um, this can be done in a way that actually brings that perspective. And precisely in so doing, I think you go back to addressing this on a continuum uh, which speaks to the, as I said earlier, the political and the social nature of these problems. But the question of leadership, I think, is particularly a, a problematic one. I do want to just check in with the audience if there are any burning questions before we wrap up, if anyone had comments or feedback. And if I don't see anything, because it is That's uh, for a past 10.30 p.m. <laughs> here in Davos, um, I will thank my wonderful panelists for coming so late in the evening. These are long days, um, but an important conversation. And uh, we hope that when we're here again next year, we'll have a slightly brighter outlook to share with you. But thank you very much, um, both those in the room and those online for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Nice to facilitate. It's a tough subject.